Midday Treat with NAZ Elite, a monthly podcast in which I chat with Hoka NAZ Elite team members, and you'll get a behind-the-scenes scoop on their training, racing, and everyday lives. I'm your host, Eric Sensman. You can find our monthly podcast on SoundCloud uh, by searching Hoka NAZ Elite, and you can learn more about the faces behind the team uh, by visiting their website, nazelite.com, their Facebook page, Northern Arizona Elite, or their Instagram and Twitter, both at NAZ underscore Elite. All right, welcome to the NAZ Elite podcast, uh, Midday Treat with NAZ Elite. This episode, episode 21 now, I welcome Stephanie Bruce. Steph, how you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, you were the first, well, when I became host, you were the first guest. Mm-hmm. This was a while ago. It was a long time ago. It was. I, I feel like I said you did a good job, so you kept your job. <laughs> That's that. right. You're welcome. It was, it was sort of like a time trial period. Yeah. Yes. It uh, it's worked out, so thank you. Of course. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, well, today, in this episode, we're going to recap uh, your year, talk through it a little bit, um, and that'll include a couple different conversations, but let's start with results, okay? I have to get out my phone and read them all, because <laughs> okay. there's a lot. <laughs> uh, and Co- Coach Ben was uh, nice enough to recap all of the results for me. So I'm going to read through these. So for those listening and or watching, uh, bear with me. There's a lot to go through. Steph, maybe you can allow these to sink in as we as I cover them. Um, it's a lot to sink in. Okay, so starting chronologically, uh, there was the New York Roadrunners Midnight Run. You were third. Uh, then it was the Rock and Roll Half, um, the Rock and Roll Arizona Half. You were first. One twelve thirty. That was a sprint finish. Uh, not not the only sprint finish of the year. Um, then it was the USATF Cross Country Champs. You were third. Uh, the Gasparilla Half Marathon, second, 112.02, another sprint to the finish, where you just just lost to Sarah Hall. Um, then it was the London Marathon, 10th, 2.32.28. I think uh, the time is worth remembering, because um, these marathons get faster as, as the year goes. Um, you then had a 5K, where you were second in 15.52. Uh, New York Roadrunners Mini 10K, 7th, 32.55. Um, then it was a couple of USATF races, the Outdoor 10K, you were third, 32.05. Uh, then it was the 10K Road, tra- road Champs, which was at Peachtree, uh, you won, 32.21 was your time there, uh, beating your, your fellow teammate, uh, Alephine, as I recall. Um, and she was on a tear at the time, so that was pretty cool. Um, Wharf Dwarf 6 Mile, fourth, 31.04. Great North Half Marathon, uh, you were there with your teammate Fobbs, um, you were 6th, 111.50. And then to close the year, uh, two marathons, New York City in 11th, 2.30.59. Uh, and then finally CIM, which was the USATF Marathon Champs, 2nd, 2.29.21, which I believe was a PR. Okay. Whew, okay. Um, <laughs> and just to, to condense that slightly further... It was your first ever podium at USATF Cross Country, uh, first ever podium at USATF Outdoors, first ever national title, road 10K PR, marathon PR. I'm exhausted. (laughs) It seems like just a podcast about bragging about me. (laughs) Well, facts are facts, you know. Uh, Results are results, I should say. Um, So I don't know if you've sat down and, and read through all your results in this manner, but um, you obviously lived through it uh, and can kind of look back on all of those. Would you, would you say, I think uh, you might have to, uh, that that was your best year of racing? Uh, yes, <laughs> definitely. Um, no, like the last couple of weeks I've actually been reflecting on 2018 and thinking about the things I executed well and maybe um, failed at in, in my own head. And even on the days that like I didn't have the performance I wanted, I was just I was very proud of every race I ran, yeah. and that was the first time I've ever had that feeling in my career. Sure, and I think that's more satisfying than let's say a certain place or a certain time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, um, we the previous episode, uh, I sat down with Ben, and we kind of. Um, reviewed the year this year. Your name was was brought up a number of times. Uh, one thing he talked about um, is that at the beginning of the year, he 
sat down with everybody and, and kind of wanted to make sure the focus was on racing. So not so much times, but just putting yourself in a position to race. Um, turns out you got some PRs along the way, but what, um, do you, would you say that was impactful in, in, I guess, helping this year and, and seeing this year go well, kind of making that the focus rather than maybe times or something else? Yeah, Co Coach Ben always has said, do the racing and the time will come. And yeah. I think he's always been right. And so this year for me, it was very much about committing. Um, not that I hadn't done that in years past, but something just kind of changed in me mentally this year. And every time I went into a race, I just... I told myself beforehand there'd come a point where I would doubt if I could keep going or if I could stay with the leaders. And I just said, how about you commit 100% and just see what happens. And it started at Rock and Roll AZ yeah. when it was supposed to be actually a pretty controlled race. So he gave me kind of like a speed limit. He's like, I want you to run between 540 and 550s, which would have been around 74, 30. Yep. Um, and then there was another woman who kind of decided she was going to push the pace a little. And so we started pretty gradual running like 545s, but then when she started to make a move, kind of my racing instincts came over and I knew Ben wouldn't be mad at me at, at that point because it was so early that I'm like, well, let's just see what kind of fitness I have. And I just kind of matched every move she made and we slowly notched down the pace. And he said, if I get to 10 miles, I can go at that yeah. point. And so... Which is a good place to go on that It course. is go because, it, <laughs> yeah, it goes, it goes down the hill, half a go, and then you make a U-turn. And so I went and she went right with me and I didn't know who she was at the time. So I'm like... A, a little bit of ego. I'm like, how is she still with me? Um, because I was running pretty fast. Yeah. Like, I was throwing down some good splits, and then with about a mile to go, you cross over the Mill Avenue Bridge, right. and she went in ahead of me, and I'm like, that's it. Like for a split second, I said, like it's over. She won, and I had done that in every race in my years past. And then I, a minute later, I said, no, it's not over until you cross the finish line. And so I got right back on her and I just stuck with her until about 400 meters to go. And right before you make a right hand turn, mm -hmm. I was still with her and I just said sprint. <laughs> and I just, I just told my brain that. And as cliche as that sounds, like I sprinted and I won by a second. And then that kind of changed or set the tone for the rest of the year. Sure. That I said, maybe there's a lot more like mentality to this. And maybe if I tell myself, just commit and then don't let anyone pass you within the last mile or the last sure. 800 of a race. And that basically happened in every race except New York City, where I was passed in the last 200 meters. Yeah. But yeah, but every yeah. other race I ran, no one passed me. So that was kind of cool. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I want to ask, um, you you recently tweeted a, a photo, and I mean recently, like 20 minutes ago, <laughs> uh, of, of the two of us in a, a, a very fun time, uh, 800 at the end of a workout on an indoor track. Um, and as you can see in the photo, I was clearly beat uh both <laughs> both um yeah emotionally Same, and yeah, actually uh -huh. yeah uh <laughs> so um i guess that that was at the start of the year so yeah you were you were doing that in training to some degree um from from the start of the year but h how much of um was there a lot you got from from training uh maybe f just finishing hard in a lot of workouts that kind of uh, lent itself to being able to do that better in, in races this year? I think so. You know, our training is very strength-based, and so we're not always doing a ton of, like, all-out 400s or sprinting, but what we really try to practice is running controlled and, like, kind of effortless for a long portion of the workout and then being able to close off of that, whatever that means. And so every time I go into workouts, I always try to run at the line where okay, if I had to change gears, could I do that? Yeah. Um, and yeah, there are some workouts where I go to the well and, and I can't necessarily like sprint at the end, but I would say Ben really um, primed that for me that whatever I was doing, no matter how tired my legs were, I was always able to sprint at the end of the workout. Yeah. Um, and that definitely gave me a lot of confidence each race I kept running that when I ask my body to sprint it did yeah. you know so i think practicing that um in practice and mentally really helped in races right right um and i mean to say that you had the best year of your career so far is 
to say something significant because you've you've had great years of racing. Um, and I'm old. <laughs> I mean, I mean. I wasn't gonna say that. <laughs> I was fine. just gonna say you've had some good years of racing. No, it's fine. I'm, um, I'm thirty. I'm thirty four. It's not typically where you see people right. starting to PR. Yeah. So. so so yeah, I guess the question just becomes, what do you think led to to this year? Well, it was probably a combination. You know, I have two children. They're three and four. And I'm finally far enough away from them that I don't feel like a postpartum mom. Like, I feel like my old self as a professional athlete who doesn't have to worry about getting injured. And I just worry about how hard I can train and how many miles I can run. But it took like a few years of just believing that it would kind of click. Right. Um, and I think I've had teammates that have helped affirm that, like training with Kelly for the last almost six to seven years when we were on a team before I had kids, she had had um, Kylan and then I just saw like it took her a few years and then all of a sudden Kylan is seven and now Kellen's just tearing it up. Yep. So it gave me a lot of hope and motivation that by the time my kids were older, if I kept at it, like eventually I'd be able to like get back to that level. And I think it was just a combination. I've been healthy for the last three years, been consistent, you know, really like put in all the work that yeah. needs to be put in and the results just kind of started to come. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And, um, I suppose I'd, I'd kind of like to close, uh, this, this podcast by, by talking about next year, but, um, it seems like a good opportunity to ask. Uh, do you, I mean, do you think this is something that's uh, something you can replicate again next year? I, th I still think that like I have my best years to come. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if that's just like a belief in me, but physically I don't feel like I'm slowing down. I feel like every time I have a marathon cycle, I come off it feeling even faster and stronger. Sure. And yeah, obviously the big um, sights are set on 2020 and trying to make that Olympic team in the marathon. But there's so many other things I want to accomplish in the sport along the way that I don't want to just put that on a huge pedestal. And I think that's what this year did since it wasn't a world year for many events. It allowed me to just not put a huge focus on any one race. Right. And I just like brought what I had to every single race I ran. Um, yeah, and sometimes I think as athletes, when we have that one key race, we can get really uptight sure. or we think we have to have this amazing training cycle. And sometimes you just need to be 90% fit and like 100% mentally tough, and that's how you're going to have good results. So right. I think if I keep that mentality over the next few years, I should be able to back up this year. Sure, sure. Uh, so I, I was listing all of your results, and there were many. Uh, to me, the most the most interesting combination and probably to anyone that, that were to look at the schedule was New York City followed by CIM. Uh, you, you mentioned there um, just a bit ago that you did get past towards the end of that race. It's the only race where you did get past at the end of the year. Um, so I imagine there was maybe a sense that like, oh, that I have more in me. I want to go back out and race again. But what was the what led to that decision? Because how many weeks apart was it? Was it was it 20, 28 days. Twenty eight days. Yeah, okay, so four weeks. Four weeks exactly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So talk to me about why you decided to run CAM. I guess first. Sure. So the the day of New York and the hours right after the marathon, I was super emotional and I was talking all kinds of garbage to Coach Ben, to my agent Josh and Larry, and I apologize to them, <laughs> you know, because you just, you put so, you invest so much in this one race and it was like one of the deepest American fields. If that had been the Olympic trials, I still wouldn't have made the Olympic team. You sure. know, I was fifth American. And so part of me was like, this is just how good I am. I'm just, I'm not in the conversation of being in, in the top American of the top Americans. And so that was like a little depressing to me thinking I did all this work and did I really belong where I thought I was in my sure. head. And the fact that I fell apart kind of the last three miles um, because I kind of went for it earlier in the marathon, it just, yeah, it was, it was just heartbreaking a little bit. And so I told them, I don't know if this event was made for me. Maybe I can't do it anymore. Um, and they were telling me that I was stupid and that I was just silly, like wait a couple hours, let it all sink in. And then the next day, you know, I woke up and I was in my hotel room with my kids and thinking about the race. I'm like, you know what? It wasn't that bad. I, I had put so much stock into it, but at the end of the day, I ran about a minute and a half off my PR in New York, and I was 11th. 10th looks a lot um, 
sexier because <laughs> it's top 10 and you're on the leaderboard and I just happened to miss that. But, you know, that's part of the sport. And so I let a couple of days go by and before I was like, I wanted to make sure I wasn't making an emotional or rash decision. Course, right. And so I texted Josh, my agent, and said, crazy, dumb idea, question mark. <laughs> and I said, see, I am. And he said, yes, like it was dumb and crazy, but how do you feel physically and emotionally? And once I kind of talked it through with him and he understood my reasoning, he said, you know, why don't you talk to Coach Ben and see what he has to say. And I was nervous to talk to Coach Ben because I'm like, he's going to shoot me down. I, right. I know it because we don't do things like that on our on our team. Um, but I talked to Ben and I kind of gave him my perspective that what I just said, I don't have many more years left in my career. And I just wanted to get a little crazy and I wanted to take a risk. But I felt like it was a calculated risk because I had been healthy. I didn't think there was a risk of injury. And he said, you know, let's do it. I'm 100% on board, but you're going to have to do it the way I want to do it and my plan, which was really not to train that much. Yeah. So those next couple of weeks, we didn't do very much. What what did that look? That was my next question. So very nice segue. <laughs> um, what did that what did that preparation look like? What did those four weeks so look I, like? So the key was, he's like, the only way you're going to be successful is if you're recovered from New York. So basically we took a week completely off. So no running, no cross training. And I just tried to sleep, uh, recover, get massages, get chiropractic work. And then the next week I ran about 50 miles. So like four to eight mile runs okay. and no workouts. Yep. <clears throat> and then basically the last two weeks, um, we just did a fart lick 20 times, one minute on, one minute off. Okay. And then I did an eight mile steady state up here at 550 pace, okay. which is my normal marathon pace yep. effort up here. And then I did a fast finish long run where I ran um, 15 miles total, but the last three were fast. Okay. And then the week of the race, I did kind of a mix of 400s, a two mile tempo, 400s, a two mile tempo and 400s. And that was it. <laughs> and yep. then the marathon. And the 15 miles with the fast finish, I imagine, was a week before That was a week the marathon. before, yeah. And so how, how, how were you feeling at that point? I mean, that, at that point, you're three weeks removed from New York, one week from Yeah, Seattle. physically I felt good. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that was attributed to the fact that I mentally changed my focus. Because usually you come off a marathon, you're like, I'm on a break. Like, I'm just going to go out and party, not care about what food I'm eating. Right. And kind of be um, a slob for a few weeks. But I think since I committed to racing another marathon, I just shifted into, well, now you have to recover. Yep. And so my body started to come around like with two weeks before CIM. And I was just feeling generally fresh. And so I didn't really ever get into that fatigue cycle, sure. which you kind of want in marathon training. Right. And then you go into the race and you freshen up. I just had to ride that freshness and hope that the fitness I had before New York would carry me through CIM. Yeah. And, and how uh, different was your outlook or approach at CIM versus New York? Or, or how similar, I guess? No, that's a great question. It, it sounds weird, but I almost had like a... It sounds weird to say, but like, I don't give a shit attitude because yeah. New York had gone how it had gone. And like <laughs> I said, I put it up on a pedestal and there were so many months put into it emotionally, mentally. And then Sam, I was like, I have nothing to lose. Yeah. Like if it goes poorly, I can say, well, of course it went poorly. I just ran a marathon 28 days ago. But if it goes well, like what a bonus. So I was really stress free. Like I wasn't worried. I wasn't nervous. I was just excited for a bib and like the starting line. Sure. And, and that's kind of all I needed at that point. Yeah, yeah. Right. When you look back, so we are, we are currently, uh, or we, um, <laughs> the team is currently, uh, doing the performance of the year. Um, the voting is happening now. Uh, I, I did submit my votes. That was oh, fun. Um, from your own performances, just looking at you, uh, do you do you have one in mind where you think yeah that, that's really what I would put uh, is my performance of the year? I mean, at first I thought I didn't know if um, he was gonna put New York and CIM as one like uh -huh. the double because yep. a few years ago he uh, he, he did my uh, World Cross 10K double yes, yep. but maybe a month apart is like too much of a um, <laughs> double. So if if those were together, I would have picked those. Sure. But since they weren't, I would probably pick Peachtree. Peachtree, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that being your first um, title, title, I think. Yeah. Correct, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, it's amazing that... Well, it's Ben and I, again, had this conversation on the last uh, episode, but it, just the performances from the team this year were... Oh, it's going to be impossible, <laughs> because like even that, like me being proud of my performance, I'm like, yeah, but Scott was 6th at Boston, and Fobbs was 7th at New York, right. and Kellerman 224, yep. and Alphine won a bajillion national titles. <laughs> So, <clears throat> I don't know. I feel bad for the fans that they have to vote, but um, it's also exciting to think, like, it's we're making it hard for people to decide what was the best performance. Yeah, and absolutely. That's, that's encouraging. Yeah, and, uh, again, uh, a nice segue, because I did want to ask, um, again, just from your perspective, uh, looking back at the year, not just your own year, but the, the team as a whole, kind of your... Um, yeah, just w how you felt about it. You know, there were some new additions uh, to the team um, in, I guess, May it was, uh, with the, the new, um, with the four ladies coming in. And then, yeah, just kind of the performances as a whole and how the team grew. Uh, looking back on all that, what do you, what do you, uh, what are your thoughts? What are my thoughts? Yeah, yeah, you know, it's been really great to see for me because I've been here since the beginning yep. and I came on the team when I was pregnant, actually. So kind of a unique scenario. Sure. And for me, like just to watch what Ben and Jen have built from the ground up and to be able to see that there are now like men and women who want to be on our team and they want to be right. part of what's going on here in Flagstaff is... It's just super rewarding, and it shows that if you buy in 100% to Ben's training and to the team philosophy, like you're gonna have results. It will take time for sure, but um, yeah, it's just been great to see like the meshing of all different personalities, but you can still work well as training partners. Yeah, I think that's valuable. It's very much like a workplace. Everyone doesn't have to be best friends, but how can in those two and a half hours each day, you make the other person better and how can you make yourself better sure uh, i think we've done a great job of that over the years you know and this year especially um it's just been shown that people's performances are elevating one another like kellen goes and runs 224 and so it makes me believe i could go run 225 226 um and same thing for the scots and and aaron at chicago so it's been it's been a really great like domino effect i think that the team has had this year yeah absolutely uh, in, in going back to, um, well, looking ahead, I guess, you, we talked about 2019 briefly, and you think, yeah, uh, there's more in me. What, what are kind of your, what are you looking forward to most about next year? Are there any races in particular or any goals? Um, obviously, the, the Olympic team in 20, 2020 is, is on everybody's radar, so you're kind of setting up for that to some degree. But mm -hmm. yeah, what, what, what gets you excited about next year? Well, we're kind of just tailoring the spring very much to like it was last year. Um, I still feel like I have a lot to accomplish in cross country and on the track since for me this year it felt like I was just getting started. Right. So I really want to carry that momentum um, after another year of like all the hard work and see where that puts me when I go compete at U.S. cross country champs and the U.S. track champs and try to make those world teams. Um, and then we'll probably pick a fall marathon based on, you know, how track goes. But I just want to compete, like you said, and I'm not necessarily hooked on time. Um, I know time will come, but I just want to beat as many people as I can and, and really see how good I can be. Sure. Uh, and I want to return to where we started before we finish. Um, I listed off all those results. It maybe took like a minute. I don't know. <laughs> so it's probably hard for it to sink in. But and, and so maybe you don't really have an answer, but what is... What does a year like this year mean to you in turn going forward? Like, had you not had this year, like you said, being 34, might you have thought um, less positively about kind of the next couple of years? Um, I, like, how big was this year? Or how important maybe for for you in terms of keeping your competitive fire and wanting to to continue? It's it's obviously hard to say that because yeah. it's hard to say if you were injured how are you how would you feel but I do think it was crucial because I felt like since 2016 like after Hudson was born I ran at the Olympic trials and it was a disaster I was almost dead last and I just kept like doing the work that Ben was giving me but I was not having the results right. and I'm like how am I able to do this in training but I can't tra translate it to racing um, and even like towards the end of 2017 even my marathons like weren't indicative of the work I was doing right. and so this year was just huge because it showed me that 
again, it does take time, like it takes patience and you just have to keep believing even if things are being thrown at you or you're not seeing the results. Um, yeah, and now, I don't know, I just, I pull confidence from like every single performance I have, even if I lost. Right. Because um, there's always something positive to look at. Sure. So yeah, there's a chance that if I didn't have this year, I'm on a question whether I wanted to keep going. Um, ultimately, I know I want to go through 2020. That yeah. has, that's definitely the plan. And I've been lucky that Hoka supported me this whole time, even through having two kids. Um, so that's been that's been huge, I think, because, you know, there's a chance if, if that wasn't the case and I'd be kind of deciding, is it worth it to keep going? Certainly. Um, and I'm sure many athletes go through that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm excited to just keep carrying that momentum forward. Yeah. And I, I want to give you an opportunity to, um, promote yourself a little bit. Uh, <laughs> but you did it in a really interesting way this year. And again, we Ben and I talked a little bit about this, but the, the grip campaign, mm -hmm. well, I'll call it a campaign. Sure, but yeah. Yeah, um, really neat. Uh, the videos that came out were really cool. Um, I know Ben was really psyched about it. What was, uh, I, I know you've talked a little bit about it, but if you can give just, yeah, a little bit of the motivation for that and kind of what that meant to you uh, this year? Yeah. So before I started training for New York, I was just trying to figure out why I was still doing this. You know, I am a mom, I have two little kids and I feel guilty sometimes and I'm away from them a lot. And I'm like, am I just, uh, like trying to prolong my career? Uh, is, is this worth it essentially? And I thought about what other people might be questioning in their own lives, their own careers. And so I did a little research on like words and meanings and the book by Angela Duckworth is called Grit. And when I read that, there were a lot of things she was talking about with her father because her father always wanted her to have certain grades and a certain level of expertise in order to like hit the standard and that felt like a big parallel on running you know sometimes there's oh you're only a good athlete if you make the olympic team or sure. your your career is defined by this result and for me i had so many second and third places in my career i never made an olympic team but i still am doing this and so i just love the word grit and she also said grit is resisting complacency and yeah resonated with a lot of people and so I put out this series with Stephen Kirsch at Rabbit Wolf Creative and we made a couple YouTube videos kind of chronicling my build up to New York yep. and then one day I was like it would be cool to maybe make t-shirts you know and that way people who either felt like they needed some grit in their lives could embody that and could wear it. Um, and the other component was my father passed away of prostate cancer and my mom has had two bouts of cancer one recently um, late stage anti or inflammatory breast cancer and I thought about watching her go through chemotherapy mm -hmm. and I'm like I think my life is difficult when I'm doing hard workouts or training on Lake Mary Road and you have people who are getting through cancer sure. and I'm like so they have their own grittiness in life right and so I was like I bet there's so many people out there who have some form of like grit that I need to tap into. Yeah, and so we sold the shirts and we donated a portion of the sales to Memorial Sloan Kettering, which is where my parents were treated. Okay. Um, and it's just been awesome because people like share their uh, pictures of themselves wearing the grit shirts online yeah. and like for some grit is running 17 miles on the treadmill at 4 a.m. And I'm like, yeah, that's way tougher than what I get to do. Right. It's my job. Um, and so I just started to think about like building those those little things in my career and coach Ben actually gave me a book a few years ago that was uh, by Gary V and it was jab jab right hook and it talked about like building your brand and what it meant and it felt like that's what I was doing all the things that I was sharing about my own personal journey were like the jab jab and then putting out this grit series how many people just like latched onto it like that was the right hook and yeah. it was really cool to see um yeah people like being part of my journey with me. Yeah, absolutely. And f for those that haven't seen it, we'll we'll make sure the links are in the the notes um, so that people can access those. Because uh, yeah, it was really well done. It was Thanks. neat to watch. Um, so to wrap things up, I don't want to put you on the spot, but here we are. Going We're to? on the spot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, well, you've mentioned your family a number of times yeah. throughout the podcast. Um, is there any? Uh, uh, interest in growing your family is that something that's still on your radar you mentioned kind of feeling like oh am i 
neglecting my family by pursuing my career. So is, it, is that something you think you may uh, return to as well that might take you out of competition for a while? Yeah, I do want to have more kids and it's kind of insane because they're crazy and hard. But <laughs> if you have kids, you also understand like they're the most amazing things and they serve a huge purpose of and meaning in life to me. And so I do want to have more, but that's where I don't know if I'd continue after having kids. Sure. So that'll probably come, you know, at the end of my career and when, okay. I, when I'm retired. Sure. But I, will, I definitely want to expand the Bruce family. Yeah. Yeah. Good. And I guess you, you have um, experience coming back from a pregnancy and I, I suppose you you know how long it takes and <laughs> maybe it would take longer than, right. than you have time for. Yeah, it's more just like, there's just so many little things like all the core work and all the pelvic floor stuff. And I feel like at that point in my life when I, I had more kids and I was done running competitively, I would shift my focus into helping other people sure. navigate their paths back. Yep. Like maybe there are younger women on my team who at that point, maybe they are starting families or just a ton of women out there who have all these questions on how to return back to sport or running after kids. I can kind of be a beacon of information and light for them sure. um, because I've been through it all and I know all the um, the dirty stuff that goes into it. Right. But I don't know if I'd want to go through it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, well, congrats again on what was uh, an exceptional year. Um, look forward to seeing you uh, continue that next year. Thank you. All right. That's it. Yeah, we did it.